Thanks to this week's sponsor, MyHeritage. As someone so interested in history, learning more about my own relatives is something I've always wanted to do. MyHeritage is the leading global service for family history research and DNA testing. Trusted by 90 million users, MyHeritage not only makes building your family tree a simple and enjoyable activity, it also gives you access to powerful tools that can help you research your family history and grow your tree. MyHeritage is home to more than 19 billion easily searchable historical records. I discovered my paternal great-great-grandfather's Albert, a cabinet maker, and Robert, a butcher, and even the houses they lived in, both in the industrial northern heartlands of Yorkshire in the 1800s. It was really quite amazing to see the actual buildings where my ancestors lived. Using their instant discoveries tool, I was then able to connect my tree via common relatives to other people's trees. I was even able to find military records and grave locations for fallen family members in the First and Second World Wars which, for a military history channel, was really meaningful to me. I used their advanced AI technologies for repairing, enhancing, colourising and animating historical photos of my great-grandparents. I found it really fulfilling to learn more about my wider family, and if you would like to as well, sign up using my link in the description below for a completely free 14-day trial to enjoy all the features my heritage has to offer. At just before dawn on the 1st of April 2003, the 3rd Ranger Battalion of the 75th Ranger Regiment arrives outside the fence of the Haditha Dam in western Iraq. This force has driven through the night from a desert airstrip established by Delta Force operators early in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Dropped deep behind enemy lines on the 27th of March, the Rangers have been guided by Delta operators to the Haditha Dam, infrastructure critical to Iraq's power grid. Their mission is to capture the dam and ensure Saddam Hussein cannot destroy it as part of a scorched earth policy, flooding the Euphrates River Valley. With two AH-6 Littlebirds of the 160th Saw hovering overhead, the attack begins. Ranger scouts breach the perimeter fence using pliers, allowing the force's vehicles to race through at 40 miles per hour. No Iraqi gunfire greets the Rangers as they speed through the gap in the fence with their ground mobility vehicles. The sudden assault catches the Iraqi army's garrison of 120 men by surprise, and most of the enemy soldiers panic and surrender when faced with the American vehicles. Sergeant First Class Jeffrey Duncan leads one of the sections of GMVs to secure the western side of the dam causeway. Using their night vision equipment to great effect, Duncan's men dismount to form a blocking detachment and round up several Iraqi prisoners who are dazed and confused by the surprise attack. The prisoners are flex-cuffed to a handrail along the road until they can be moved to a safer location. Another platoon of rangers storm the massive administration building and begin clearing its hundreds of rooms. After quickly exhausting their breach charges and shotgun shells, one ranger later recalled, We turned to having a couple of guys throw a fully loaded ranger with body armour against the doors to knock them down. A couple of us got mighty sore doing it, but we eventually got the job done. It will take four hours for the building to be completely secured, and 25 civilian workers are placed under guard. Meanwhile, Duncan's men come under fire from an RPG team on the western side of the river. One of his snipers fires back at a range of 1,100 yards, but instead hits a propane tank behind the enemy soldiers. The propane explodes in a massive fireball, taking out the RPG team in the process. With the southern end of the dam secured, Sergeant Duncan then leads his men across the dam's causeway to secure the northeastern side. As they're moving across, a truck full of Iraqi soldiers arrives and is immediately engaged by one of the GMV's 50 caliber machine guns. Five Iraqis are killed instantly, but the rest dismount and take cover. This leads to another firefight which lasts for a full hour. By mid-morning, the remaining Iraqis will be driven off and the top of the dam secured. Sergeant Duncan and Sergeant Major Alfred Birch will later receive the Silver Star for rescuing three wounded enemy soldiers while under fire. The last three days of Operation Iraqi Freedom have seen a pause in the main offensive from the south, while the American and British forces consolidate their gains. In the north, the Kurdish Peshmerga, supported by US Special Forces, have successfully destroyed the Al-Ansar Islam militant group in Operation Viking Hammer. To the south, the US 101st Airborne Division and two battalions from the US 1st Armoured Division have spent the last week clearing out the city of Najaf, 
while 2nd Brigade of the 82nd Airborne is engaged in urban warfare in As-Samawa. To the southeast, the British are continuing their siege of Iraq's second largest city, Basra. Iraqi defences at Basra are gradually being worn down, but the garrison continues to resist. At the Haditha Dam, the Rangers have secured the power station and electricity transformer, while another platoon sets up a roadblock on the main road to the town of Haditha. Although they have overrun the 120-man strong garrison, there are 6,000 Iraqi combatants, 44 armoured vehicles, 14 155mm artillery pieces and approximately 100 anti-aircraft guns in the surrounding area, most of which are now converging on the 154 Rangers. As they are fortifying their positions, the first wave of this force arrives. 3rd Battalion is attacked by a group of 50 to 100 Iraqi soldiers coming from the south. The American positions also come under mortar and RPG fire. Although the Americans are far from their logistical base, the Iraqis are attacking piecemeal and on foot making them easy targets. The Rangers savage the Iraqi ranks. The Iraqi forces Roland SAM launchers and S-60 anti-aircraft artillery have yet to arrive in the area allowing Little Birds to make several gun runs on the infantry without opposition. The attackers are further smashed by 120mm mortar fire and accurate airstrikes. After a one-sided firefight, the outgunned Iraqis retreat in disarray. The Rangers are confident after their victory, but little do they know, these attacks will arrive roughly every 30 minutes for the next two days, with slow but constant Iraqi 155mm artillery fire throughout. At the river level, a platoon of rangers are clearing out the lower dam face when they come under heavy fire from two buildings next to the river. The Little Bird's weapons aren't strong enough to destroy the position, so an airstrike is called in. A pair of A-10 Warthogs arrive to drop guided munitions on the two buildings. The first bombing run is a direct hit, but the Iraqis will reoccupy the ruins over the next three days, harassing the rangers with machine gun and mortar fire. It will take 10 airstrikes and 20 guided bombs to finally silence the position for good. To the southwest of the Haditha Dam, the 3rd Infantry Division from the US 5th Corps under the command of Lieutenant General Scott Wallace prepares to assault the Karbala Gap, a natural choke point which lies between the Bar al Mil Lake and the city of Karbala. Moving through this area will allow 5th Corps to avoid costly urban fighting and outflank Iraqi units to the west, although the assault on the gap is expected to be one of the toughest fights of the campaign. The narrow bottleneck is only 1,700 metres wide at its narrowest point and offers good fields of fire to the Iraqi defenders, who can use lush palm groves as cover from air attack. Furthermore, there is a more pressing need to quickly overwhelm Saddam's forces in this area. Coalition Intelligence has identified the Karbala Gap as the start of the Red Zone, the area outside of Baghdad where Saddam is expected to use chemical weapons as a last resort to stop the invading forces. Lieutenant General Wallace intends to draw Iraqi forces away from the Gap by making a feint towards the Euphrates Valley to the southwest of the capital. However, the commander of the 2nd Republican Guard Corps, Lieutenant General Rad al-Hamdani, correctly anticipates this strategy. He argues to Qusai Hussein, chief of staff of the Republican Guard and one of Saddam Hussein's sons, that he needs two divisions to cover the gap. Yet, Qusai dismisses Hamdani, saying, The plan for the defence of the capital has already been decided, and your role is not to challenge it, but to carry it out. The assault begins at 2am on the 1st of April. Despite the fears of chemical attacks and tenacious Iraqi fire, Colonel Will Grimesley's 1st Brigade Combat Team of the 3rd Infantry Division faces only light resistance as they advance through the narrow choke point. The brigade is limited to hard surface roads due to the muddy rice fields they are advancing through, but most of the Iraqi fighters are on foot, without armoured support, and are quickly overwhelmed by the attack. By 6am on the morning of the first day, Grimesley's 1st Brigade Combat Team is the first American unit through the Karbala Gap. They race towards Al-Qaeda Bridge, codenamed Objective Peach, which is the key to opening the door to Baghdad. An understrength Iraqi battalion is defending the bridge, 
while the Iraqi 2nd Corps Reconnaissance Battalion is also believed to be on the east bank of the river. After their stellar work at Objective Jenkins outside of Najaf, Grimesley's men are tasked with capturing another bridge over the Euphrates River, the last significant obstacle between coalition forces and the Iraqi capital. The forward scouts of the 3rd Battalion 69th Armoured Regiment move towards Objective Peach at 11am on the 2nd of April, but fall back after realising that the bridge is defended by the enemy. Marcone will attack with 1,100 men, including two tank companies, two infantry companies, engineers, and chemical reconnaissance platoons to search for WMD. The advance is also supported by massed artillery and six Apache attack helicopters, underlining the importance of capturing the bridge. Marcone's plan is to bombard the eastern bank using artillery and air attacks to destroy any Iraqi demolition teams. Then, Alpha Company 11th Engineer Battalion will cross the river on inflatable boats and disable any explosive charges they find, while artillery covers by pounding enemy positions with a combination of smoke shells and high explosives. Finally, Marcone will push his battalion across and establish a bridgehead. The assault on the Iraqi forces defending the western bank of the Al-Qaeda bridge begins at 11.30am. The Abrams of Captain Chuck O'Brien's Alpha Company make a flanking attack, three sections of three tanks each in line abreast. The 18 155mm M109 artillery pieces of the 1st Battalion 41st Field Artillery Regiment lay down a barrage ahead of the tanks while a company of Apaches engage Iraqi defenders with rocket and cannon fire. Having learned how the Iraqis defended the bridge at Objective Jenkins, Marcone and his engineers pinpoint potential areas where enemy soldiers could be taking cover. Most important is knocking out Iraqi engineering teams, which can blow the bridge at any given moment. Close air support also arrives overhead to bomb the enemy positions on the far side of the river, hoping to give the assault force enough cover to get to the bridge. The Iraqis break and retreat while 3rd Battalion surges forward. At shortly after 2pm, the first American tanks spot the bridge at Objective Peach, but are engaged by Iraqi RPG teams. Staff Sergeant Steve Smith's Abrams takes a direct hit from an RPG, which severs hydraulic power while Iraqi fighters rush the damaged tank. Despite the Abrams filling with smoke, Smith and his crew slowly rotate the turret manually while the rest of Alpha Company lays down protective fire. Iraqi soldiers attempt to overrun the tank by attacking through tall grass, but are mown down by machine gun fire. The Iraqis are killed or driven off and the Abrams push forward to the edge of the river. After an intense battle, the west bank of the Euphrates is secured by 3.30pm. Knowing the enemy could blow the bridge at any moment, Marcone orders Captain Dan Hibner and his engineers to move to the other side as quickly as possible. Although there are motors for the inflatable boats being brought up from the rear, Hibner decides there's no time to waste and instructs his men to paddle across using oars instead. Some of the boats set off with their engines in place, but most cross without them. At just before 4pm, the crossing begins. Marcone's artillery begins their fire mission, mixing smoke shells with high explosives to cover the engineers as they begin the perilous voyage across the Euphrates. However, strong wind blows the smoke away just as the engineers are crossing. The first boat, commanded by First Lieutenant Kevin Caesar, immediately begins drifting south. No matter how hard Caesar's men paddle, a strong current carries the boat towards a two-story building where the Iraqis are targeting them with machine gun fire. One of the sappers deadpans, Oh, we're dead. Seeing this disaster unfold, 3rd Battalion opens up on the building with everything they have, providing much needed covering fire. Caesar's boat and two others drift south of the bridge, but land on the east bank safely. They must now trek up to the far side of the bridge to disarm the explosives. Meanwhile, 5th Platoon of the 92nd Chemical Company sets up a smoke generator in an exposed position on the west bank of the Euphrates to better provide cover for the engineers. The engineers themselves are almost at the span when, at 4.15pm, the Iraqis suddenly detonate the charges affixed to the bridge structure. When the smoke clears, the southern span has been seriously damaged, but the northern span is still intact due to the Iraqi sappers incorrectly rigging detonation cords. 
Once it's safe to continue their duties, the engineers rush to cut the rest of the wires, while their covering fire intensifies. One sapper, Sergeant Robert Stevens of Alpha Company, must venture into 10 feet of water to cut a cord hanging near one of the piers. He swims out to the pier and cuts the wire, but when he starts swimming back, his heavy pack begins to weigh him down. Stevens disappears beneath the water, believing he is about to drown. Luckily, an embedded reporter, who is accompanying the force, has watched Stevens go about his task and jumps into the water, pulling him to safety to the bank of the river. Infantry now begin clearing the buildings on the east side of the river. A javelin anti-tank launcher is brought forward to engage the enemy position in the two-story building. The javelin is launched and streaks through the air at the building, making a direct hit and collapsing the entire structure. Iraqi soldiers now begin abandoning their defensive positions, some approaching the Americans with their hands raised in surrender, while others flee the battlefield. At 4.35pm, Hibner reports that the southern span can still be crossed with vehicles, and Marcone's armour begins rolling across Objective Peach. In a final attempt to stop the crossing, Iraqi artillery fires more than 200 152mm shells at the west bank of the bridge. This is a simultaneous time-on-target mission, utilising the last Iraqi artillery units in the area. They have caught the American forces at a vulnerable time. Not only is the bridgehead still fragile, but there is no Q-36 Firefinder radar in the area, meaning the Coalition's MLRS and tube artillery cannot locate enemy batteries and fire back to suppress them. During the bombardment, men of the 92nd Chemical Company remain in place to provide critical smoke cover for the engineers working on the bridge. When the vicious barrage ends, the bridge still stands, and American vehicles continue to cross, although several Abrams and M2 Bradley fighting vehicles have survived close calls with shrapnel scars to show for it. Objective Peach is secured, and three armoured companies cross the bridge. However, the battle for Objective Peach is not over yet. Lieutenant Colonel Marcone pushes Charlie Company forward to secure an intersection three miles to the east of the bridgehead to establish a blocking position. A mechanised company from Captain Dave Benton's Bravo Company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Infantry Regiment, crosses the river, dismounting infantry to clear bunkers, and then heads north, destroying a company of BMD Light Infantry Fighting Vehicles of the Medina Republican Guard Division. While his forces are extending and consolidating the bridgehead, Lt. Col. Marcone receives word at 9pm that the Iraqis are preparing to counterattack. General Hamdani has gathered a special Republican Guard Commando Brigade and a brigade each from the Medina and Nebuchadnezzar divisions. Marcone has been alerted to the Special Republican Guard Brigade, but US intelligence has failed to locate the main threat of the Republican Guard Armoured Brigades. The American commander orders his men to dig in, while his air liaison officers designate kill zones where close air support will devastate the attacking enemy columns. At 3am, the counterattack begins with an Iraqi artillery barrage. The Republican Guard Commando Brigade assaults on foot from the north, while the brigades from the Medina and Nebuchadnezzar divisions strike 3rd Battalion's perimeter from the south, hoping to crack the American line in multiple places before pushing on to the bridge. To counter this, Marcone has prepared a two-pronged defence, with Abrams, Bradleys and Apaches representing the first, while alternating artillery fire and airstrikes act as the second prong. Despite its supposed status as an elite formation, the men of the Special Commando Brigade are poorly led and suffering from bad morale. The demoralised commandos are easily beaten off with heavy casualties. However, the Iraqi armoured formations to the south attack with more aggression. A company of around 50 T-72s lead the assault, followed by two companies of American-built M113 APCs, totalling around 50 in staggered columns. The tanks of the 3rd Battalion quickly knock out the first three T-72s, killing the Iraqi brigade commander in the process. In keeping with the two-pronged defence, American MLRS and artillery is located 7 miles away, and it takes 33 seconds for US artillery rounds to land. Each time the artillery fires, Marcone's air liaison officer calls SHOT, and the close air support aircraft are told to stay clear of the battlefield. 
As soon as the rounds land, the aircraft resume their attack. Hundreds of Iraqi soldiers are killed in the hurricane of artillery and rocket fire and close air support. Despite the massive disadvantage in firepower, the Iraqi forces demonstrate remarkable courage in assaulting the American lines throughout the morning. The Abrams of Captain Jared Robbins' Charlie Company use their thermal sights to knock out multiple T-72s. Their enemy has no such night fighting capabilities and are massacred en masse. The combat rages for over two hours but the Iraqis fail to dent the American lines. By 5.30am, one of the largest tank mechanised engagements of the war draws to an end. Three American servicemen are killed in action and another 60 wounded while the Iraqis suffer between 700 and 1,000 dead. No American armoured vehicles are lost while 18 T-72s and 30 APCs have been destroyed by the Coalition's combined arms firepower. The capture of Objective Peach places Coalition forces just 30 miles from the Iraqi capital. General Hamdani will later compare the loss of the Al-Qaeda bridge to the American capture of the bridge at Remagen in the Second World War, which allowed the Allied armies to storm Western Germany. General Franks and the Bush administration are briefly concerned that Saddam will finally unleash his chemical weapons now the coalition has breached the Red Zone, but no such attack takes place. Fifth Corps is now in position to assault the Iraqi capital itself. By the afternoon of the 3rd of April, the situation at the Haditha Dam hangs in the balance. The 3rd Ranger Battalion has held their ground against wave after wave of enemy counterattacks but the dam itself is on the verge of collapse. Iraqi shelling has destroyed an electrical transformer, knocking out four of the five turbines needed to safely operate the dam. The turbines are the only source of power for the dam, without them the interior will flood and could cause a catastrophic structural failure. With the last turbine about to fail, Sergeant First Class Kevin Camp, a Special Forces Engineer, enlists the help of the remaining Iraqi workers to help him save the structure. While the battle outside rages for the next week, Camp and the Iraqi dam workers toil around the clock to keep the last turbine operational. The rangers solidify their defensive perimeter over the next seven days, aided by constant resupply missions and airstrikes which keep the Iraqis at bay. A pair of Abrams also join the fight after being airlifted into H-1 airfield and driven to the dam. The Rangers are finally relieved on the 10th of April after 10 days of constant combat. During this time, 3rd Battalion of the 75th Rangers, along with their supporting 120mm heavy mortars and air support, have destroyed 24 Iraqi mortars, 28 155mm artillery pieces, 23 AAA guns, 29 tanks and 3 trucks. Between 3 and 400 Iraqi soldiers are killed in the battle while three rangers are killed and six wounded. Ultimately, the dam is saved, preventing a catastrophic flood from sweeping an active war zone. The US Air Force will soon fly in engineering personnel to bring the rest of the generators and turbines online. Over the next two days, the 3rd Infantry Division methodically rolls up the flank of the Medina Republican Guard Division. The unit which provided fierce resistance during the Gulf War and during the last two weeks of Operation Iraqi Freedom, is destroyed for the final time by the 4th of April, clearing the Karbala Gap. To the northeast of Objective Peach, the capture of a key highway intersection, codenamed Objective Saints, on the 3rd of April, cuts off Baghdad from the south, isolating a large portion of Iraqi troops tasked with defending the city from that direction. The stage is now set for the main assault on Baghdad, the US 5th Corps is advancing on Baghdad from the south, while the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force is isolating the capital from the east. Hoping to avoid prolonged urban warfare, American commanders are planning on using a new strategy to storm Baghdad, the Thunder Run. Sign up using my link in the description below for a completely free 14-day trial to enjoy all the features MyHeritage has to offer. Thanks again to our amazing Patreons, who make series like this possible. Welcome to all our new Patrons this month, and a special thanks to our Patron of the Week, Alex Pickworth. Each week we select our favourite Patreon reactions to shout out. This week, 
Arkasha Lethal says, Throwing rangers through doors, accidentally blowing up an RPG team. Overwhelming force and violence of action are so ingrained in US military doctrine, it almost happens unintentionally. If you'd like to join our Patreon and get access to exclusive benefits such as early access to videos ad and sponsor free, we would love to have you as part of our community.